warm welcome to everyone joining us in today's session. The session has a very highly esteemed speakers and we're expecting it to be quite engaging. On our panel, we have Ms. Simoneta Zarili, who is Chief of Trade, Gender and Development Program at the Division of International Trade and Commodities at UNCTAD. We have Ms. Nadira Bayat, Gender and Trade Consultant at UN Women. Professor Edme Dominguez from World and Development Europe, White Plus. Ms. Maureen Penjueli from the Pacific Network of Globalization, PANG. Ms. Diana Yahaya, who is a member of the Gender and Trade Coalition, the GTC. Please help me to welcome our panel. And without wasting time, let us go directly into the topic of today. Today, we're going to be discussing regional trade agreements and gender. We will hear some views from UNCTAD, UN Women Consultant, Academia, and Civil Society. Let me take this chance to invite um, Edme. You have been working on regional trade agreements in both the European Union and Mercosur. Could you tell us, please, what opportunities or gaps exist for women in the context of the EU Mercosur agreement? Hello, everybody. My name is Edna Dominguez, and I'm a part of the board of White Plus Women in Development Europe. I'm as well a researcher and a professor at uh, the School of Global Studies in Gothenburg University. And my presentation today is going to be about Mercosur and the AU trade agreement. And I'm going to share the screen right away. As I said before, this is going to be on the gender processes in free trade agreements, the case of this trade agreement between the European Union and Mercosur. So we start with saying, what are the general effects of free trade and gender? And these are opening markets and trade liberalization that have redistributive effects and change national economies as gender processes of production, reproduction, and consumption. That means the issue is not only about opening the markets, but the process surrounding this opening. Because according to the European Commission here in this quote, market access for services and investment, opening public procurement, better agreements, and enforcing a protection of IPR, intellectual property rights, unrestricted supply of raw materials and energy, and not in the least overcoming regulatory barriers including via the promotion of international standards, which also should go and make it made easier. So all these are the effects of redistribution that are the cause that are caused by free trade agreements. In Latin America, we have these free trade agreements since the 90s, but since the 80s, there was a neoliberalization and then a new export model of production. And this is, uh, for example, assembling industries, which we call in Mexico maquilas, and from agro exports. So that in Latin America, the average import tariffs decreased 45% in the mid-80s and 13% in 1994. Five, also non-tariff barriers decreased from 31 to 11% in the same period. So by 2001, all Latin American countries had entered the World Trade Organization. So what was the point of negotiating free trade agreements? Well, the point apart from increasing exports was also to attract investment and for industrialized countries to protect their investments, focusing on public procurement, intellectual property rules and low labor standards. And so we see how this goes together with the feminization of labor in Latin America, where we see that in 2018, about 52% of all women in working age participated in the market labor. Since the 80s, more and more women are forced to go into the labor market because they need it to make ends meet. And also because the education levels among women increased during this time. So this process coincides with a feminization of export jobs as the reserve army of labor for export competitiveness. That means underpaid workers in all low wage export industries 
in many Latin American countries, and that means at the industrial and agro-export sectors. And you see in this table how women participate, labor force participation, as a percentage of the female population ages 15 plus per region. And we see that Latin America ranges quite high from 90 to 2018, with nearly 52% of women eh, under these ages working. So the AI Mercosur agreement took more than 20 years of negotiation. The AU was already the second partner of Mercosur. And Mercosur, from being this successful integration scheme during the 90s, with increasing internal trading, having protectionist measures to protect internal industry, opened itself. First, it got China as a major, major trade partner and started the process of reprimarization prior to the export of raw materials demanded by China, like soya and meat. China became Mercosur's first trade partner. Also, from having progressive governments since the beginning of the 21st century, Mercosur went back to reactionary populist regimes in Brazil, Paraguay, and Argentina by the time of the signature of the agreement, which also contributed to the final signature. By mid-2021, the only progressive regime was in that region was Argentina. So now we see how this global chain of production utilizes women. As I said before, the typical case is the maquiladoras assembling factories, which is mostly in the case of Mexico and Central America. But in the case of Mercosur, it's agricultural sector. The globalization decreases traditional agriculture it, that is related to local food markets and increases agro-exports produced for export. And women in many cases dominate certain places of, of this chain of production. And we have in the case of South America, Brazil, Colombia, Chile, and Mexico as concrete examples. What are the possible effects of this free trade agreement? from the gender perspective. According to the impact assessments done in, since 2009 in other studies, the potential economic consequences are a deindustrialization de and much more emphasis on agricultural exports. That means more reprimarization, but also the expansion of the agriculture frontier at the cost of the Amazonas rainforest and other kinds of forests. More extractivists, together with reprimarization, the decrease of jobs in non-agricultural sectors affecting women particularly, given this uh, barrier in the labor markets. And this is also affecting the livelihoods of women in the affected areas like rainforest. In fact, several indigenous movements have taken position against the agreement and they are being led by women. So from the AU side, there are more than 450 organizations engaged in a huge campaign against the agreement. Even if due to the law of several groups in March 2018, the European Parliament adopted the, the gender in AU trade agreements motion, which is unfortunately not binding. The AU argues free trade is good for women if they are entrepreneurs, but there are no special support measures, even for these groups of women within any free trade agreement. Other groups of women are completely disregarded. So the European Union considers gender to be a priority for internal policies and legislations, but obviously not so much for trade agreement. Finally, we need more studies to be done regarding the concrete effects of this agreement on the different groups of women. But we already know that the agreement will have general effects as the industrialization, encouragement of reprimarization, deterioration of labor markets and general ecological threats to livelihoods of peasants and indigenous groups. Well-educated women in certain sectors of the economy may be benefit, but even this is far from clear. These trends will reinforce the fears of this treaty contributing to an unsustainable model of development, unsustainable from a human and from an ecological perspective. These are some of the sources, and thank you very much. It's very interesting to see how um, a trade agreement 
does not only have limited impacts, but it affects everything, including livelihoods and particularly the livelihoods of women and also affects even the climate, as you uh, rightly mentioned there. Um, just to carry this conversation on, and I think it ties in nicely with um, what you have shared with us now, I'd like to invite Maureen Penjueli to please speak to us on what is what is the, the context um, in terms of the post Cotonou agreement. And uh, I would imagine speaking from the perspective of the Pacific region. Are there similar, similar challenges? How is that working out? Sorry, please go ahead. Thank you, Michelle, and it's wonderful to join this esteemed panel. Um, I think there is quite a lot of similarities in terms of what we've just heard in terms of the uh, eu Mercosur uh, agreement. Um, this one that I've been asked to speak on is on post Cotonou agreement. Maybe just very quickly looking at the context of relationship, uh, which is a cooperation relationship between Europe, Africa, Caribbean and the Pacific. Um, initially was a relationship that was post-colonial and it was about the European Union um, trying to maintain access to ACP markets, economies and natural resources on the one hand and on the other hand allowing ACP countries um, preferential market access to the European market which is one of the largest in the world uh, in addition to aid. And that cooperation has guided the relationship between Europe um, uh, and the ACP for a long time, up until uh, coinciding quite neatly with the structural adjustment programs of the late 1990s into 2000, where the WTO started to push back when Brazil and Australia took uh, the European Commission uh, to dispute over the preferential uh, treatment given to uh, sugar uh, exporting countries from the ACP. Uh, and so the relationship in many ways changed from preferential uh, quota free market access into the European Union uh, and replaced by free trade agreements such as the Economic Partnership Agreement, uh, which considered that we had to reduce all barriers, so neoliberal uh, and quite extensive in terms of uh, beyond goods into services, government procurement, uh, intellectual property rights. Um, uh, and so, yes, so quite extensive. So the economic partnership agreement uh, became the instrument, uh, free trade instrument that the European pushed uh, quite heavily uh, in the Cotonou agreement. Uh, there was lots of solidarity amongst uh, ACP and EU civil society uh, supporting ACP countries to resist this kind, this extensive neoliberal free trade agenda um, being pushed by the European Union under the pretext that the WTO ruling uh, required that our countries liberalize extensively. Um, so the post Cotonou agreement in many ways is just the extension uh, from uh, Cotonou agreement. Uh, negotiations for the post Cotonou Agreement started in 2018. Um, the agreement was just concluded in 2020, December 2020, and initialed uh, between the ACP and the EU uh, on the 15th of April this year. Um, so it, it, it's in many ways still new in terms of trying to analyze to understand what the impacts would look like uh, in this new treaty. Uh, I think there's some key things. There are two components to the treaty. So there's this general parts. Um, it's binding for 20 years. Um, and then they have three regional protocols that are specific to the context of Africa, Caribbean, and the Pacific. But both these annexes and the general parts are binding by nature. I think it's quite um, important to understand that this is uh, a political instrument. Um, it, it is one which doesn't recognize that historical debt between Europe and its former colonies. Um, it's about mutual respect, shared responsibility, reciprocity, solidarity, and accountability. 
But what it really denies is that the asymmetry persists. You've got 27 EU member countries, some of the most advanced industrialized countries on the one hand as parties, and then you have 79 African Caribbean Pacific countries which are developing LDCs since, if you like. So this asymmetry still persists uh, in terms of the overall treaty. Uh, and as I've said, it's quite extensive in this coverage. Um, one of the key things that we were really, really concerned about is that it was concluded in the height of a pandemic. Um, so when it was initial, one of the key things that we noticed was that the pandemic itself was not really reflected in the treaty text. It appears in the preamble part of the text, and then once after that. And I think what it really, I think should emphasize is that many of our countries were really struggling um, to deal with the pandemic and to conclude a treaty of this size and scale. Um, and then I just want to come very quickly to uh, talk a little bit about the gender and development dimensions that we need to be thinking about in terms of research, uh, lobby and advocacy for civil society. Um, there are two overarching instruments that guides the post cotonou agreement. The first is the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and the second is the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Um, Gender is cemented in the treaty, so there are provisions in the treaty itself. Uh, it appears in the objectives and principles of the treaty, uh, and it talks a lot about gender equality, eradication of poverty and inequalities. Uh, one of the challenges is that its approach is through mainstreaming of gender uh, perspectives and to ensure gender equality, it is mainstreaming. Um, you find gender equality in um, key strategic priorities section of it, and is seen as quite critical in terms of sustainable and inclusive development. Uh, and so I think you see the appearance of gender equality. Um, sorry, so some of the research that's really coming out that's starting to do uh, some analysis on uh, whether you know, reflection of gender um, equality in the treaty itself will mean anything. Uh, it has been undertaken by Concord. I think that's a useful resource to start with when you're looking at gender impacts. Um, and there are some concerns that they're reflecting. And one of the key things that I think is quite important when we're thinking about UNCTAD itself is that in terms of gender inequality, unless the instrument acknowledges that inequality is derived specifically from a neoliberal economic development model, then it would be very difficult to then start challenging or addressing gender equality. So that's one of the fundamental problems with the treaty as such. It assumes that through neoliberal reform agenda of our legislations and policies that we will achieve uh, will eradicate poverty and we will achieve uh, equality, including gender equality. Um, there's some concerns around how to actualize the financial mechanisms. Um, so there's you know, lots of good words around gender equality, but the instrument is new um, to understand how to access the kinds of finances necessary to transform uh, and empower women. A woman is considered within the economic component, mostly through entrepreneur. Uh, so, you know, just access to financing, but those don't recognize the kinds of structural challenges um, that women and girls will face into the future. So I think they are now, it's a new instrument. It will be ratified uh, by the end of this year, uh, November, December. That's where the negotiators are looking to, con to, to ratify. Um, and so we will start to see implications, of course, in the next uh, couple of years once the treaty comes into force. Um, so I think those are some of the key things that I think is quite useful to reflect from in terms of the post cotonou agreement. Thank you so much, uh, Maureen. It's um, interesting to see how the 
the current trading system has been shaped over the years by different policies, including um, and probably more more visibly the neoliberal policy. Um, in terms of that, I'm wondering if from the African region, are there any um, indications that this has had positive or negative implications for women. And I'm, I'm looking back at what Maureen mentioned about the structural, structural adjustment programs. We know that um, since the first uh, treaty that mentioned gender in Africa in 1983, there have been other instruments that deal with gender. But what difference is it going to make in the African continental free trade area? Will it be any different? And um, how would it be different as we're looking forward since its implementation earlier? Um, Nadira, over to you. Hi, my name is Nadira Bayat and I'm the Gender and Trade Consultant with the UN Women Ethiopia Country Office. Now I'm going to be talking to you about women's economic empowerment in the context of the AFCFTA. Now, before I address your question, Michelle, allow me to thank the Gender and Development Forum First, for the invitation to participate in this timely session on regional trade agreements and gender. And second, for providing a platform that unites us from across the Atlantic in our collective effort and common objective to champion gender equality and women's economic empowerment goals in regional trade agreements. Now, before I discuss why I think advancing women's economic empowerment through the AFCFTA will be different to previous commitments by African governments to support women's empowerment or to promote gender equality in other trade agreements. And particularly, I'm talking here about the treaties of Africa's regional economic communities, the RECs. Allow me to briefly reflect on the African continental free trade area itself. Now, about the AFCFTA. So very quickly, the framework agreement establishing the African continental free trade area was signed on the 21st of March, 2018, in parallel with the Kigali Declaration and the protocol to the treaty establishing the African economic community relating to the free movement of persons. Now the AFCFTA agreement entered into, first, entered into force on 30th May, 2019. The AFCFTA is the continent's most ambitious integration in initiative to date, and it incorporates the following main objectives. Firstly, to create a single continental market for goods and services with free movement of business, person and investments. Second, to expand intra-Africa trade across regional economic communities and the continent in general. And third, to enhance the competitiveness and support Africa's economic transformation. Now, in terms of architecture, the AFCFTA agreement is a framework agreement covering various protocols, including the protocol on trade and goods, trade and services, investment, intellectual property rights, competition policy, as well as dispute settlement. Now, the protocols on trade in goods and trade in services have been negotiated in phase one, with negotiations including tariff concessions, rules of origin for goods, and schedules of specific commitments for services still ongoing. Phase two of AFCFTA negotiations will cover investment, competition policy, and intellectual property rights. And an AFCFTA protocol on e-commerce and digital trade, as well as a protocol on women in trade, are planned to take place alongside the phase two negotiations. So back to your initial question on what makes advancing women's economic empowerment in the context of the AFCFTA any different to advancing the same goal in other regional trade agreements. I think it's, it's very important to remember the considerable, the massive political support that accompanies this ambitious and historic Pan-African program. And part of this support is steeped in a growing recognition by African governments and policymakers of the importance of gender equality and women's economic empowerment for inclusive socioeconomic development. And this is one of the general objectives of the AFCFTA agreement, and it's seen as a means through which to buttress inclusive AFCFTA implementation. Now, the AFCFTA implementation was negotiated at the continental level. It's a continental agreement. 
but implementation will take place at the national level, at country level. And because gender distinct trade barriers and inequalities can restrict the ability of women to trade, tailored interventions, context specific interventions in the form of gender responsive AFCFTA policy reforms and trade facilitation measures are needed for women and for women led businesses to leverage the tremendous opportunities inherent in the AFCFTA. Now, building on interventions at the regional economic community, the REC level, African governments and policymakers are supporting inclusive AFCFTA implementation through gender mainstreaming in AFCFTA national implementation strategies. Governments are doing this alone and with the support of development partners, including the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, the ECA. Now, the objective of this process is to inform gender responsive AFCFTA policy reforms, gender responsive trade facilitation measures and other complementary interventions for women and for women led businesses to harness the opportunities of the AFCFTA. And this can be, for example, through recommendations for the creation of an enabling legal and policy environment, including through addressing discriminatory legislation and the removal of legal barriers to women's employment in various economic sectors and entrepreneurship, to building the export and training capacity of women-led businesses, to empower women in regional value chains, to closing the gender gap in access to finance, to implementing a gender responsive trade facilitation agenda, to bold the trading, the low trading capacity of women in trade, to improve access to digit to e-commerce and digital trade solutions, and to advance gender sensitive sector specific commitments for trade in services liberalization. Now, we, we're seeing a really active and concerted effort by policymakers to empower women as part of AFCFTA implementation through support for targeted economic empowerment interventions that are set out in countries' AFCFTA implementation action plans. And at the same time, women themselves are advocating for policy action through a dedicated protocol on women in trade. And it is for this reason that during the December 2020 Extraordinary Summit of the African Union Heads of State and Government, the AFCFTA Secretariat was directed to commence work on drafting a protocol on women in trade. Now, UN partners are supporting this endeavor, in particular in the preparatory phase of developing the protocol on women in trade, UNDP and UN Women are helping to um, gather the views of women in trade on the ground at the country level, so that the starting point of the negotiations will be solution driven and influenced and informed and guided by the voices of women. UN Women, the AFCFTA Secretariat and UNDP are also undertaking an online regional survey to understand the challenges and the opportunities that women and women-led businesses face in the establishment of the AFCFTA. Now, this online survey aims to determine the constraints and bottlenecks hindering women's participation in trade, to identify potential opportunities and the impact of the AFCFTA on women and on women-led businesses. And all these efforts will culminate in a high-level Women in Trade conference convened and led by the AFCFTA Secretariat in Ghana, in Accra, that, that really hears from women in various economic roles on what they would like to see in a protocol to facilitate their engagement in trade. And then to anchor the design of complementary policies are also calls from women across the continent for gender related considerations to be integrated in all AFCFTA protocols, including in the soon to be negotiated protocols on intellectual property, on competition, on um, investment, on e-commerce and digital trade. So, so Michelle and, and colleagues and friends, there really are significant opportunities going forward for women to lead the discourse on gender sensitive and inclusive provisions as part of these negotiated outcomes for various protocols that are to be negotiated. And these are some of the priority interventions that are unfolding in quick and rapid succession and often simultaneously across the continent that distinguishes advancing women's economic empowerment 
in and through the AFCFTA from other explicit commitments to support women's empowerment um, that, that are set out in other trade agreements and, and particularly the RECS treaties. And, uh, but above all, there's really this strong, there's this widespread recognition from African governments, from the private sector, from civil society, from all the partners that will anchor inclusive AFCFTA implementation that the AFCFTA needs the full and equal participation of Africa's women. Because without the equal participation of women in this historic and bold Pan-African initiative, we really will lose a generation of progress on inclusion and, and our very ability to rebuild from the COVID-19 crisis for the Africa we want. There, there is a strong recognition of that. And I have no doubt that this intervention intervention will distinguish itself from all others. Um, thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much, Nadira, for your insights on that. We move over now to Diana Yahaya, who is going to, perhaps, can you give us some perspectives from the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement uh, in terms of, again, the issue of gender and the interactions with trade? Um, thank you so much, Michelle. And once again, I'm so grateful and honored to be here in this esteemed panel um, at the very first ever um, conference on gender by Angkat. Um, I want to start off by saying, given that I'm coming in right after um, all the other speakers before me, um, by sort of like pointing out and mentioning that we live really in a time where there is an endless proliferations of trade agreements, um, whether you have them bilateral, plurilateral, regional, multilateral, and, and so forth. And I, some of the, the ones that the speakers before me have gone and shared are really just a few of them, really just touching the surface of the magnitude of how much trade agreements we are really, really faced with um, in this particular moment of time. And with these proliferations of trade agreements, what comes with it is so are also trade agreements that are continuously, ongoingly, um, and never endingly expanding into different issues, newer issues, you know, emerging issues, and all of them with a very specific and particular implication on everyone, um, but a very particular and acute implication on women and girls, and especially um, women and girls from developing as well as least developing countries. So I wanted to start off by sort of like mentioning that as well. Um, I also do want to kind of draw an attention how I think it was about five years ago um, when a group of 10 human rights experts had actually sort of like um, issued a statement that was intending to draw an attention of everyone. And this was during the height of the negotiation for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, really wanting to draw attention on people um, on the detrimental impacts that trade agreements, such as the TPP or many others, have on the enjoyments of human rights, um, whether they would be civil, cultural, political, as well as social. So that was actually something that was already highlighted about five years ago by numerous United Nations human rights rights experts. Um, and then I also do sort of like want to now go into the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership by just starting off to give people a bit of an introduction into it. Um, it is, as the name suggests, an economic partnership. It consists of the ASEAN countries, which is the Association of Southeast Asian Nation countries. So there's 10 of them there. Um, and originally six of ASEAN's main trading partners, but that number became five when India decided to withdraw um, just before the signing of the agreement from the agreement itself. And so what remains within it are the 10 ASEAN countries, as well as its five trading partners, which is basically Australia, China, Japan, New Zealand, as well as South Korea. Um, and these, this particular agreement in the way it's being drafted and how it's broad ranging and it was signed at the end of last year, similar to what happened with the post cotonou agreement, virtually by many members of government and even some stages of its later negotiation also took place virtually, which brings in a lot of questions around how did those negotiation processes proceeded? How did it took place? Um, these were spaces that were traditionally never open to civil society or women's rights or 
organizations, but you find that these spaces had shrunk even tremendously when it moved virtually as well as online. And so by the time any news emerged around it, it was basically that it was going to be signed virtually. And so there is tremendous questions around the policy making spaces, the participation and voices of women's human rights, civil society organizations, you know, think tanks and other groups and interest people and interest groups. Um, and that is clearly one of the things that is devoid from the regional comprehensive economic partnership and many other trade agreements um, that are also out there. And then the particular impact that RCEP is anticipated to bring, it's currently not ratified yet, so it will take a couple of years to fully sort of comprehend the kind of implication it will have. But there were um, very recently a study that was put out by Ankar itself, which really shows the tremendous amount of government revenue losses as a result of the losses in tariff revenue that a number of the developing and least developing countries within RCEP will actually experience. And just to sort of illustrate how much losses in government revenue this actually amounts to, um, they did a comparison and they found that for a country like Malaysia, which is where I'm from and is a middle income country within the RCEP context, uh, it's expected to lose 2.2 billion a year as a result of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. And that amount is actually equivalent to the yearly wage of all of the public health nurses and healthcare workers in the country. And similarly, you have Cambodia, at least developing countries, is also within RCEP, who is expected to lose 1.2% of its GDP, which is just 0.4% short of the annual the GDP percentage that it dedicates to its public health expenditure. And so when we look at this current context where there should be, you know, an expansion of like the money that we put into looking after our public health workers, into our public health system, that's not the effect that RCEP will actually bring to a lot of developing and least developing countries. And then there are also a tremendous amount of questions which remains unanswered, to be honest, um, with the inclusion of the investor state dispute settlement within the RCEP which is currently on hold but could potentially come back and how that could be used for a lot of developing by a lot of corporations to really undermine the sort of policy actions or fiscal policies that governments would take whenever it actually uh, affects a corporation investments as well as profits. Um, and so when we hear the impact of what that might have for developing and least developing countries, what does that mean for women? So firstly, as we know, women do rely on public services more than men because we carry most of the burden of unpaid care work. Um, and so any cuts or losses in government revenues inevitably translates into cuts on public services and then inevitably translates into a very, un very unfortunate impact and further poverty as well as marginalization of women as well as girls. Um, the second point is really around the use of affirmative action, which is, of course, we recognize as women's rights organizations and feminist movement. We do know that we require states to many cases use affirmative affirmative action as a way to address all of the discriminations, patriarchal practices that are embedded within the market. And so this you know, policy space for state to carry out affirmative action can be constrained by the RCEP because of all the different policies that it has to be changed within a government and all of the different policies that can have a potential impact on corporations in terms of their investments as well as their profits. Um, and finally, I just want to add to what, because we're looking at a number of like regional trade agreements and then also looking at free trade agreements as a whole, um, what would we need in order for FTAs as well as regional trade agreements to actually really work for women? I mean, and for me personally, it all starts with, you know, really acknowledging the fact that market is gendered it's not non-biased, it's very patriarchal. And if you leave it to run by itself and in its search and pursuit for profits, it will inevitably exploit, um, oppress, as well as discriminate, as we can see with the existence of gender pay gap, all the precarious type of employments that women are often found in. And so there is a role for state to step in and address those discriminations and inequalities, which will not address by itself. Um, the second point is that, oh, Sorry, can so I, can, you, do, can you start rounding it up, please? Thanks. Yeah, so I just have two more points. Um, the second point is really we need an approach that looks beyond gender clauses or gender chapters. 
and really look at trade agreement as a whole and how it impacts on women. Um, because the effect of, well, these are really good initial first steps towards addressing gender inequality. These chapters box women into a, a particular space. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't acknowledge that women are also you know, patients and rely on intellect, you know, and intellectual property rules impacts on them, that they are workers and so labor rights will also impact on them, that they are entrepreneurs, you know, small, medium enterprises, sellers, producers, and all other chapters of the trade agreement do impact on them. So it's not just a gender chapter or a gender class. And finally, it's really about looking at women beyond just as actors of market. Um, and really acknowledging that women are people who do have the rights to make decisions uh, around politics, around the economic rules, as well as policies that really have an impact and shape on their lives. Um, and I'll end with that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This is clearly a conversation that should be going on because there's a lot that is uh, still there to address. But um, maybe just latching on to what you have mentioned, um, I want to to come back to uh, to Edme. You <clears throat> you spoke about how the EU uh, Mercosur agreement in its in its implementation um, would undo or cancel some of the benefits that had accrued through the Mercosur agreement. So I'd like to ask you um, how does how how are these gains being reversed? And um, and also in terms of um, women's participation in the labor market, which you also mentioned is affected by trade. Can you please speak to that a little bit more uh, in just a few minutes, please? Thanks. Yes, uh, regarding your first question, uh, as I said before, it is regarding the industrialization. That means that uh, this AU Mercosur agreement will encourage more exports from the European Union of industrial goods. And that will uh, necessarily affect the production of these industrial goods in Mercosur, which had advanced very much during the Mercosur formation since the late 90s uh, up to 2020. And as I said before, these uh, Mercosur have created an internal market, which was quite uh, protected, especially for these industrial goods that were uh, produced, especially in Argentina and in Brazil, and which uh, had a, a consuming uh, market, a consumer market within Mercosur. And uh, what this a Mercosur agreement will threaten is this kind of protectionism. So what is feared is that all these industrial goods will be uh, part of uh, the victims of these new free trade agreements, and uh, because all protectionist barriers will disappear. And and, and then uh, the other part of your question: so how um, women will be. Uh, affected and um, I think th there are many, many scenarios in this. Uh, as I said before, we have to take into account the long, the, the medium and long-term uh, trends. And one of them is uh, the expansion of this kind re of reprimarization of this kind of um, uh, agro exports, which are being encouraged by the agreement, because uh, this is uh, one of the issues of the agreement, and uh, this will necessarily affect also the kind of jobs that are offered to women. Uh, what I could say as well is that if you look to the example of NAFTA in with Mexico and the United States, what happened with NAFTA is the creation of maquilas. That means the creation of this kind of um, assembling factories for cheap industrial goods that were not really produced in Mexico, but that would assemble in Mexico by cheap labor, especially women. That could be a scenario that could happen in the case of Mercosur, because we have a lot of investment of several um, industrial firms from Europe in, in Mercosur, especially in Brazil, and then you could 
easily turn Brazil and Argentina into a maquiladoras kind of base uh, using cheap labor and deteriorating the, um, the already uh, bad situation for industrial workers. Thank you so much, Edwin. It, it comes out from um, your response that there are gendered implications um, and that there's um, gender segregation even <clears throat> within markets and within labor. Mm. Thank you for highlighting that. And Maureen, you've mentioned a lot of different challenges um, or different concerns that may affect women in the Pacific um, in terms of the post Cotonou um, agreement. So my question to you is, in your view, which of these different challenges is the most pressing concern and uh, how do you imagine it could be addressed in order to, um, ad in order to ensure that gender equality is, is not lost along the way and to ensure that the advancement of women is not um, forgotten or ignored um, in this world we live in of um, mainstream neoliberalism, if I may. I think one of the things that we do really have to pay attention to is um, how the European Union will want to uh, pursue a trade agreement. So post Cotonou is uh, it's a wider political, uh, economic, social, cultural uh, cooperation between the parties. Um, so they're still uh, they're still unsure whether the economic partnership agreement, which is the uh, trade component, free trade agreement between Africa, the Caribbean Pacific and Europe, whether that's and how that will be pursued in the post Cotonou uh, era. At the moment, what the treaty says is that it's, um, it's not gonna force countries that haven't, particularly from uh, the African region to sign on to the treaty, but it does remind countries that have signed, whether to the comprehensive uh, agreement, EPA agreement, or to the interim agreements, uh, including those, if you have rendezvous clauses in them, that you start, the European Union will start to push. Now we know from the EPAs, the impacts, the impacts are quite extensive and they mirror what Diana was talking about in terms of the wider implications around free trade agreements. If you just look at from goods uh, tariffs, in the case of the Pacific, both Papua New Guinea and um, Fiji, in many ways were forced to initial the interim EPA agreements because of loss of tariffs, which have been quite significant. Now tariffs make such a big part of government's revenue across the, the Pacific Island countries. It's quite significant. And what trade agreements do is that they just keep reducing them within shorter and shorter timeframes uh, to zero. So governments replace that with other kinds of taxation, which then transfers the burden to people such as VAT, value added tax. Again, when you look at it from just a purely tariffs point of view, it's implications around public services, health, education, you know, and again, the gendered impacts become quite clear. So we know a lot more from the EPAs, but because this treaty is very new, it is just about to be ratified. I think it becomes quite clear that this is a watch and see how the European will want to push new areas. So they have new interests and the new interests are in access to natural resources, particularly in the oceans. So the blue, blue economy will feature quite high for the Caribbean and the Pacific. Uh, it's quite an aggressive uh, player in terms of fisheries, both at the WTO uh, and through this economic partnership agreement. So again, the gendered impacts in terms of fisheries, particularly for women fisher folks, uh, will be increasingly become more pronounced, uh, but it's one to watch and see. So I think in certain sectors, we need to watch to see. Uh, we have some experiences in, in other things, but I think this is just some of the key elements in terms of impact. Um, overall, we have to test the language of the treaty. As I said, 
it does talk about the care, it recognizes the care economy, uh, recognizes informal economies. It pays a lot of attention to that in, in the wording of the treaty, but how that translates will be another matter altogether. And so I think without clarity around financing, how to access financing, the challenges that Diana mentions about even getting to negotiate the treaty, let alone implement the treaty to ensure that women's equality remains high on the agenda, that's still outstanding. So I think there's a process challenge that we have uh, in terms of getting women, women's groups, women's human rights groups to participate, particularly developing the programs. We need to be at the forefront of that. That's not clear. Um, this is still up to states to determine where appropriate uh, and whether they will consult. Uh, and the financing instruments, as I say, still remain uh, unknown at this stage. So I think we still have quite a lot of work to continue the research and to, to accompany uh, this new instrument, the post cotonou which will be called the Samoa Agreement once it becomes ratified. So what I'm taking, thank you for, for your response. What I'm taking from, uh, from your response is that there are a lot of developments that um, we need to keep an eye on and to, to really understand how they're being implemented, how they will be implemented and how they will affect um, women in different sectors, including the fishery sector, right? And uh, also this delicate, um, this delicate balance between how do we grow the economy on one hand and on the other hand, how do we ensure that there is equal opportunity for development for women? Right. And uh, and um, making sure that women are able to get the most benefit out of the trade agreements that are that are being concluded. So while these processes are developing, um, it's it's important to just perhaps um, keep an open mind. My understanding is that there are different perspectives on which model supports the most benefit for women in trade. There are views that support that uh, trade um, is beneficial and view and other views that trade is not beneficial. So to you, Simonetta, in your view and perhaps in your experience, can neoliberal policies coexist with the advancement of all women um, across the board in terms of um, women in the corporate uh, field, women cross-border traders, grassroots women, all the, you know, in all those different contexts, uh, can neoliberal policies coexist? And also within the context of the right to development and human rights broadly. So it's a bit of a packed question, but um, maybe you can have a go at it. I think that we have uh, studied uh, and analyzed several regional integration groups, but uh, in my presentation, I will focus on these two specific uh, examples. I will now share my presentation. Okay. Um, as I said, these are two, uh, the, the two regional groups I will address in this presentation are the Eastern African community that includes uh, Burundi, Kenya, Rwanda, South Sudan, Tanzania, and Uganda, and Mercosur that includes Argentina, Brazil, uh, Paraguay, and Uruguay. Now, uh, so we are talking about the two uh, different continents and uh, uh, countries that are quite uh, uh, different. So I will go to some similarities and dissimilarities between the two uh, regional groups. So let's uh, uh, start with how gender issues were addressed in the treaties, in the founding treaties of these two regional groups. In the case of the Eastern African community, gender issues were part of the, uh, um, the integration process since the very beginning. Indeed, the ESC treaty includes provisions for gender equality and uh, um, women's empowerment is regarded as a precondition for the social and economic development of the group. Uh, further, in 2017, um, uh, the, 
the countries, the, the, the ESC countries, uh, passed the Gender Equality and Development Bill. That is a bill that uh, um, uh, mandates to include gender considerations in all policy strategies and the legal acts of the participating countries, and of course for harmonization of gender rules. If we move to Mercosur, we have a completely different situation. At the beginning, when Mercosur was set up, the two founding treaties, the Asuncion Treaty and the Oro Preto Protocol, did not include any reference to gender. All the emphasis was on uh, how regional integration would further uh, economic development. But this lack of attention on uh, gender issues was uh, compensated by very active uh, um, feminist and uh, um, civil society movements that uh, led to the inclusion of uh, uh, gender consideration in, uh, in the functioning of Mercosur and on its uh, institutions. Now we can ask ourselves a, a key question. How the different way in which gender issues are included in the founding treaties of regional integration groups has an impact on the outcomes. So as the fact that the AC included the gender equality at the very beginning and it, the, the goal of gender equality was included in the founding treaty has led to different uh, outcomes as compared to Mercosur that at the beginning ignored issues related to gender equality. Now it is quite challenging to set a causal link between what is included in the treaties setting up regional groups and the, the outcomes, what is the situation for women in everyday life. We can say that uh, uh, progresses toward the gender equality and women's empowerment have taken place in both uh, regional groups, and this is indeed a uh, positive development, but still there are uh, uh, significant gender gaps in both uh, regions. And what, uh, what could be the inhibiting factors? What is uh, playing against uh, reaching gender equality and empowering women? Perhaps one uh, reason is the legal nature of the gender provisions that may not be bold enough. The second one is that the countries within the two regional groups may have a different level of commitment and a political willingness. For instance, we know that within Mercosur, Uruguay can be regarded as a kind of a gender champion. And within uh, um, the Eastern African community is Rwanda, which can be regarded as a gender champion. The other uh, member countries may have a, a relatively lower level of commitment. Uh, going ahead with the similarity and dissimilarities between the two regional groups, let's look at the socioeconomic context. Uh, we know that Mercosur as a group is uh, uh, um, richer than the AC, and indeed the, the GDP per capita of Mercosur is six times higher than uh, for the AC. See. Uh, both regions uh, ex um, face a high level of income inequality. Um, Mercosur being a, 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 a richer uh, regional integration group performs better than the AC in terms of, for instance, of childcare support, labor protection, and tax incentives. And finally, um, Mercosur and the BAC are both economies dominated by services, but still agriculture plays a key role in exports for both groups. And both groups uh, face the challenges in developing the manufacturing sector. <laughs> 
So what do, do we know about employment in two, two groups? We know that uh, for the ESC, employment in agriculture is uh, extremely important for both uh, men and women. And we know that in Mercosur, it is the services that uh, uh, is the main employer for uh, uh, men and women. Uh, in both regional groups, there has been a shift from agricultural to services uh, in employment during the, the process of regional integration. But what are the kind of services that are available, especially to women? And here the issue is that uh, uh, the services that mainly employ women are services that uh, involve uh, low level of skills, low level of technology, are the kind of uh, um, services that can be provided without having the specific uh, skills and knowledge. So they are not, uh, um, they don't provide a kind of a particularly empowering uh, kind of employment. If we look at the trade structure, again, we have similarities in, in the sense that both groups um, uh, export mainly uh, um, uh, primary products um, and resource-based manufacturers, while they import medium technology uh, manufacturers. Regarding their uh, trade partners, um, uh, the traditional markets uh, for uh, imports and exports were for uh, Mercosur, uh, North America, and for the ESC, um, the um, European Union. This has been changing and uh, uh, countries in Asia, especially India and China, are taking uh, an, um, an important share of uh, import and export for uh, both regional groups. So what do we discovered through this exercise? We discovered that uh, the um, that the, uh, the reduction in tariffs on export markets. So the fact that uh, when the two blocks export, uh, export to uh, countries, to outside countries, the, uh, the decrease in tariffs had a positive impact on women employment. And this is indeed a very positive outcome. So more employment for women, um, wage employment. Now we know that wage employment can be really uh, um, much more rewarding than uh, work, working in family farms or doing unpaid work. So we see uh, an improvement. At the same time, we looked at which, which specific kind of employment was uh, uh, open to women. And we realized that uh, um, these new employment opportunities came out especially in, uh, um, in the kind of what we call the, uh, the blue collar uh, tasks. So tasks that don't uh, involve um, managerial capacity, don't involve uh, high skills, but are the kind of line assembly kind of jobs. And this, of course, has uh, uh, important implications because uh, 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 a job is empowering, can uh, offer opportunities to women to progress and to, uh, to go ahead, especially if it, uh, if it is an employment that uh, gives perspective for skill developments for career advancing. And this kind of employments that in both regions have been created are not this kind of employment. If we look at the other side, so what, uh, what uh, happened once the two regional groups lowered the level of tariffs, so uh, the um, import competition effect, we see that uh, women were very marginally impacted uh, in the UAC, and there were some negative effects on women employment in Mercosur, but really very, very limited. 
So, um, what can we say uh, as a conclusion is that we have looked at two regional groups, which are really different. First of all, they are in two geographical continents. They, um, they, the level of development and the level of wealth is different. Um, the, the way they address the gender issues in their founding treaties um, is different. Nevertheless, we see that uh, um, there are still significant gender gaps in, all, uh, in both regions. And we see that uh, the process of uh, regional integration led to the same results of creating uh, job opportunities uh, for women, but not the kind of job opportunities that uh, are really empowering uh, uh, women. Now, one important step forward could be to uh, um, improve the uh, women's skills, and uh, that would most likely open the way to uh, job opportunities in the tradable sectors. Regional funds could be used to uh, um, for this skill development, but also to provide, for instance, child care facilities, because this um, having to, uh, to cope with uh, uh, household responsibilities is uh, uh, a big burden for women and a big impediment to be more available for uh, paid uh, employment. And the final point is accountability, because uh, if countries take commitments within regional integration groups, but then nobody check if they are doing what they committed to do when they joined a regional group or when they set up a regional group, then in a way they could escape from their responsibility. So to make countries accountable for what they do and how they adhere to their commitments. So this is the end of my presentation. As I said, uh, this presentation is based on a study and in the slide you will see the web link to the study if you are interested and wanted to go through it. I hope this presentation has been of interest to you and uh, you will find uh, all information about uh, our studies, uh, on uh, regional, the impact of regional integrations on women on the dedicated web page that, uh, and you will see the address on, uh, on the last slide. Thank you for your attention and a good continuation. Thank you, Simonetta. And now I'd like to ask, Nadira, what are your views? They've, there has been um, discussion and um, development of the gender, of a gender trade protocol for the African continental treaty, uh, free trade area? So my view is that an AFCFTA Women in Trade Protocol is a critically important tool for gender equality and women's economic empowerment, and consequently as an engine for inclusive socioeconomic growth and sustainable development in African economies. But I think it's very important for us to learn from and to address those issues of contestation that have arisen in the context of the Joint Declaration on Trade and Women's Economic Empowerment on the occasion of the WTO Ministerial Conference in Buenos Aires. Now, the lead up to the negotiations on the Women in Trade Protocol provides a significant opportunity for us to hear from women in their multiple economic roles as entrepreneurs, as wage workers, as small scale informal cross-border traders, on what they would like to see reflected in their protocol. But the AFCFTA Women in Trade Protocol does offer us this unique opportunity, this new opportunity to put in place a holistic approach, that an inclusive approach that's grounded in principles of gender justice, of, of human rights. And, and that dictates that jobs, which the majority of women undertake, will also need to be valued. And, and the fact that gender wage gaps and gender-based 
reduce occupational segregation, which is sometimes seen as boosting competitiveness, is addressed in, in those sectors um, in which it exists. So yes, I do think that there's a significant opportunity for us to learn from civil society and, and to address the concerns that were raised in the context of the Joint Declaration on Trade and Women's Economic Empowerment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now what I'd like to ask, and I'll, I'll pose the same question to all the panelists. We've discussed, you know, um, the, the regional trade agreements, and we've looked at the intersections, we've looked at the points of contestation, and now um, what is your take-home message? What is, in, an, in a nutshell, almost like a lightning round, what is your, what is your take-home um, in terms of what would you want to be the takeaway message for the UNCTAD mandate? The take home message would have to do with empowering civil society, giving civil society more voice in all these kind of treaties. Because these treaties are uh, carried out by governments and sometimes or most of the time in secrecy. So we don't know really the process, what is taking place. They uh, argue that they put into this negotiation also people representing uh, trade in different groups within the countries, but they never really take it seriously the voice of uh, civil society, especially women groups, especially women movements. So the take message what is really take that seriously, incorporate the views of the different uh, feminist and women's movements in the countries when these treaties are negotiated and not only after they have been signed. So I think that is very, very important, uh, uh, empowering civil society. Thank you so much. So what I'm gathering is that um, your take home message is that women, sorry, is that civil society organizations and especially um, women's movements should be part of the negotiation process and not just come in right at the end um, of the negotiation. Okay, thank you so much exactly. for that. Thank you so much. And um, for you, Simonetta? Uh, let me start saying that, that uh, uh, the trade community for many, many years has, a hold the, uh, has held the position that uh, uh, trade is gender neutral and there is no point in making links between trade and gender equality on women's empowerment. Uh, the fact that the trade community has started looking at trade policy as one of the, main of the many policies that can be used for gender equality and empowering women is a quite recent development. I would say that this debate started not more than five, six years ago. And uh, I would say, as all developments, you start uh, uh, with the not particularly bold uh, uh, steps. For instance, we know that uh, several uh, free trade agreements now include uh, trade and gender chapters. And there are many uh, criticisms on the fact that these chapters are not particularly bold and um, might be a bit lost within the overall um, trade and gender, um, uh, free trade agreements that may have more important and bolder chapters. On the other hand, this is a, a, a right criticism. On the other hand, uh, uh, I, I believe that uh, when uh, that a step-by-step -step approach is, uh, is needed. The countries are probably are not ready to jump into really very bold measures to be uh, included in trade agreements to achieve gender-related goals. So they are kind of moving in, 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 in trying to see if they start including some provisions, if they start thinking about the trade as a good policy to achieve gender-related goals, how what what are the results? So is in a way these are timid steps, but these maybe are necessary steps 
that will lead the two in the future to uh, bolder positions. So let's be positive and hope that from these timid steps, uh, countries will move to bolder step and really trade along with the many, many other policies can be used to, uh, to reach the goals of um, gender equality and uh, women empowerment. Great, thank you so much. And Maureen, um, what would you like to be, to us to take away from, from this discussion? I think in addition to really supporting that active and open and transparent engagement by civil society in untightened negotiations, I think it would be really good to also support a progressive mandate uh, for UNCTAD. Um, the challenge is the new liberal uh, paradigm. I think that there is enough evidence that suggests that new liberal uh, policies and economics doesn't work. And in fact, it is at the base of the growing inequality right now. Um, so it would be quite uh, good to see that kind of progressive mandate uh, emerging from UNCTA, challenging the basis of neoliberal econ economic models as the only way uh, for growth uh, by th the developing South, if you like. Thank you so much, uh, Maureen. So what I'm gathering from you is that um, firstly, the importance, reiterating the importance of active, open and transparent engagement. And then also um, for UNCTAD to take a progressive mandate that challenges neoliberal policies because of their impact on women. Okay. I'm waiting for you to nod. <laughs> I'm hoping I've captured it correctly. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> And, uh, and then for you, Diana, what is your takeaway message? So apart from really echoing what both Edna as well as Maureen has shared, for me, it's really like to not box women or silo gender and women's human rights into a chapter or a clause because women are patients, they are workers, they are seed keepers, you know, they are educators, they are users of water, public services and health and so forth. So you can't just put them in one sort of like, clause or gender, you know, both tie and then say that this is going to be wonderful for women's human rights and gender equality. So that's my biggest one liner, like don't box and silo gender and women's human rights. All right. So I've captured that as don't box and silo women's rights. Women are not a homogenous group. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the insights. I think we've all learned a lot from this session. Thank you so much, everybody.